giving the talk today. Um, okay, so we will get started. Uh, as said, my name is Jack, um, and today we also have Georgia and Isha presenting. Uh, we are presenting just a bit of an introduction into play audiometry, um, and we really hope you enjoy. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat, and we can definitely try and answer them as we go. Uh, so to start off with, I just wanted to give a quick overview of today's presentation. I'll begin with a bit of an introduction and a background to play. Uh, Isha will then jump in and discuss the setup for testing. Georgia will walk us through some testing procedure stuff. And then I'll jump back in again with some tips and tricks and we'll end on some case studies and a quick quiz with Georgia at the end. Um, so I will get straight into that introduction. Uh, so in this section, the goal is to provide a bit of context to where play audiometry fits within our paediatric test battery and discuss why it is such an important test. Uh, so in order to do this, I actually wanted to start off by introducing some of the previous tests that uh, make up the PED test battery. So a really big part of the PED space is picking a test that matches the developmental ability of the child sitting in front of you. And so to do that, we have a spectrum of tests that can be used to establish the hearing status of uh, the paediatric population from when they're first born, right up until they're about seven years old, where we typically expect that they can then be tested under the adult test battery. Uh, so the PED test battery starts with quite simple tests that are easier to perform and require very little from the child. But as the children get older, the tests we employ become more complex and most importantly, allow us to gain a more detailed insight into their hearing status. So the first test I wanted to talk about is our objective tests. So this test is typically used in infants when they're zero to six months old where possible. This testing does require more specialized equipment. So it's not always realistically possible. Uh, examples include the auditory brainstem response, otoacoustic emissions and auditory steady state response. Uh, each of these tests are measuring some sort of response from the auditory system rather than actually getting a behavioural response from the child. Uh, so they typically require either the infant to be asleep or quite still, and they can take anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours um, for testing. The benefit of these tests is that they can provide quite an objective indication of hearing status and they can often test ears separately and isolate frequencies, meaning they can give us quite a comprehensive insight. However, as already mentioned, they do require that specialized equipment and both the ASSR and ABR testing require the child to be asleep or still, which is definitely more difficult as the kids become older than six months because they like to move around quite a bit. Uh, and that summarizes our objective tests. The next test we have is behavioral observation audiometry or BOA for short. This test is quite simple and typically used for children aged zero to nine months when objective testing isn't available. So simply put, BOA is just an assessment of unconditioned behavioral responses to sound. Testing involves the child usually sat on the parent or guardian's lap where we present a series of sounds from uh, across the frequency range and we're watching for any kind of response from that infant. So sound we use are things like a Manchester rattle, which we say is typically in the 8 to the 16 kilohertz region, as well as sounds made by the audiologist themselves, like the mm -mm sound, which covers the 160 to 1200 hertz regions. As these sounds are presented, we just monitor the intensity level with a sound level meter, uh, a sound level meter, and we're looking for any kind of response from the infant, whether that be smiling, blinking, or a startle to that sound. Um, so overall, this test is pretty quick to perform and requires very little from that child. However, it does have a number of drawbacks in the information that it is providing us. So the sounds we use are covering bands of frequencies rather than isolating uh, specific pitches. The interpretation of responses can be quite subjective. Um, and we're only obtaining free field hearing information, meaning we're presenting sounds into the open and therefore we can only really obtain the hearing status of the better hearing ear. So this test is usually good for determining whether hearing would be adequate for normal speech and language. However, where possible, more reliable tests such as objective testing or those older age tests I'm about to talk about would be preferential. Um, so the next test on our timeline is visual reinforcement audiometry or, oh, sorry, or VRA. This is where our behavioral testing technique starts to become a bit more complex and reliable and is usually used from about nine months to two and a half years old. 
So VRA involves conditioning a child to respond to sounds played through speakers. The child typically sits on their parents' laps and either a puppet or a screen with animations is located to the side of the child, which acts almost like a reward for responding to the sound. Um, so at the beginning of the test, uh, through a bit of a conditioning phase, the child is taught uh, through lots and lots of encouragement to turn towards that reward uh, in response to the sound. And following that conditioning, the child is required to turn independently when they hear the sounds and we're able to threshold seek through doing that. So overall, we would say this test is definitely stronger than BOA. We're able to obtain uh, some reliable behavioural responses and we can test frequency specifically. So the only drawback, again, being that we're only able to obtain free field information. So we can't isolate any differences between the ears. Okay. Um, and finally, we reach about the two, two and a half year old mark where we begin to use our test of interest, which is play audiometry. So... What is play? Uh, like VRA, play is a behavioural assessment of hearing. It involves teaching the child to play a simple game in response to some sound stimuli. The games involved can vary quite a bit and may just come down to what's available, but in some examples can include Connect Four, where the child puts the counter in when they hear the sound, or something as simple as putting like, like a toy dinosaur in a bucket when they hear the sound. So typically we would use play for individuals in the two to five, uh, two, two and a half year old range up to seven years old, but these aren't strict guidelines. For example, there may be some two and a half year olds that just aren't quite developmentally ready for play. So they may revert back to one of the previous tests like VRA. Or there may be some older children or certain adult populations that aren't quite suited to the adult test battery. So they can be tested under play too. And so we may be wondering why introduce another test and not just use VRA for all the children. Um, and the main reasons we opt for play would be firstly, we typically see that by the age of about two, tests like BOA and VRA become much less interesting to the kids. So kids older than two are more interested in getting involved. They don't just want to sit on the parents' lap anymore. So we need to have a test like play in order to keep them interested. Secondly, on average, play audiometry is able to get a higher number of responses out of the children. So in the interest of, uh, of obtaining a complete audiogram, uh, play is definitely better. Um, and finally, audio, uh, play audiometry is the first pediatric behavioral assessment that allows us to get separate ear information. So by this age, the children are usually uh, willing to let us put headphones on so we can test each of those ears separately, something which just isn't really possible with BOA or VRA. And so, as I already mentioned, there are some times where children two and a half years or older aren't quite development, uh, developmentally ready for play. And so we would define the minimum requirements to be considered for assessment using play as developed fine motor skills. This is just because the kids are sometimes required to, to complete those sort of fine motor tasks, like picking up the dinosaurs and putting them in the bucket. Um, and developed enough to be able to understand some simple instructions. This is just because at the very start of testing, we need to be able to show them and teach them how to play the game. So they do need some receptive language in order for this to work. Um, and finally, the minimum requirements for performing play would be a quiet room. A soundproof booth is uh, definitely ideal, but it's not always possible. Um, and then just our testing equipment, which includes our audiometer, headphones, phone conductor, and the game or task. Um, so that's everything from me. I'm going to hand over to Isha now, and she will keep going. Thank you, Jack. Um, just before we talk about how to perform the test, we will talk a little bit about the setup. The setup includes the room, the equipment, which is our audiometer, the toys, and the stimulus. So let's talk about the stimulus first. So we use wobble tones in play audiometry. Now, wobble tones are amplitude modulated tones compared to our usual study, steady pure tones that we use in the pure tone audiometry. Now, we use this different wobble tone because it, is, it does sound more interesting to children in this age group compared to the usual pure tones. Now, also when we use pure tones, we can sometimes see this phenomena called standing waves. This happens when the distance between the tympanic membrane and the diaphragm of the headphone matches the wavelength of the stimuli that is being presented, and this cancels out the sound. 
Now this causes poorer threshold and we can see a false hearing loss. Now, just to avoid this, we use wobble tones instead of the usual PR tones. And this generally happens in the higher frequencies. We want to avoid it and we use wobble tones. Okay, now let's talk about the next, please. Let's talk about the transducers. So headphones are most commonly used. And at first the headphones are kept on the table and then we move on and place it on the child's ear. Georgia will talk a little bit more about this. Insert earphones can also be used for this testing and it can be used particularly when children are extremely reluctant to put the headphones on. And also when we perform masking in our pediatric population, we use insert earphones. Now the third is the bone conductor. This is used when we find that the thresholds are elevated and there's a hearing loss present. So the bone conductor, as we can see in this picture, the headband is placed on the child's head with the bone vibrator be placed behind the child's ear on the mastoid bones. We do this so that we can determine whether the hearing loss is conductive or sensory neural in nature. If the child is really reluctant to put the bone conductor on, we can also remove the bone vibrator from the headband and hold it against the child's skull, but we need to apply adequate pressure on it. Moving on, now this, uh, this slide talks about the play activity, which is really important as we need the child to be engaged in the activity for as long as possible. Now the tasks should be age appropriate, simple and fun for the child. Older children from four years of age enjoy a task that is challenging, such as putting coins in Connect Four or building some towers. We can also engage with the child during the activity by asking them what they are building or what pattern are they making, uh, just to keep them more engaged and keep them excited while playing the task. Younger children enjoy tasks like throwing dinosaurs in the bath or when such games aren't available, a simple activity of throwing corks inside a bucket can be used. It is important to use age appropriate activities as older children may get bored instantly with simple tasks and younger children may not understand complex tasks. Also, younger children may not have the fine motor ability to manipulate smaller objects. Now, play tasks can be changed in between the appointment if the child loses interest quickly or does not engage with some activity. Sometimes some children can have a strong preference for one activity over, the, over another. So for example, some children may not engage at all with animals, but will love putting dinosaurs in a bath. So a few tasks, few different tasks can be kept handy in case we need to change in between the session. Moving on. Let's talk about the room setup. So as you can see here, the room setup consists of a small table and chair for the child and the audiologist. And you can see that the audiologist is sitting right down at the level of the child. The child can sit in front or adjacent to the audiologist. And it's important that the audiologist is close to the child as well as the audiometer. So the audiologist can present the stimuli from the audiometer from one hand and also engage with the child with the other hand. But it is important that the audiologist does not give any cues that the sound is going to be presented. There is another chair close by for, from the child, for the child's caregiver, as their interaction may be required during the testing. Now, as you can see, the headphones are actually placed on the table with the diaphragm of the headphone facing the child. This is because the stimuli it comes from the headphone during conditioning in free field. And the headphones should be placed before the child comes in. Now, this is because if the headphones are removed after the child is already in the room, the child will get distracted by it. If it's already placed on the table, the child will most likely not react to it. Along with the headphones, there are toys kept on the table for the child to play. Some additional toys are also kept handy, but they are away from the child's reach. Now, on the other side, we also have the audiometer. Uh, the audiometer should be set up before the child comes in. It should be ready to go. And the testing screen should face the audiologist and the child should be sitting opposite so that the child cannot see what's on the screen. And moving on, 
now Georgia is going to talk a little bit more about the testing procedure and how to do the test. Thanks, Isha. So uh, now we'll move on to the testing procedure. Um, so before we start testing, we will need to give instructions to both the parent or guardian as well as the child. So for the parent, all we would really need to say is, um, today we're going to teach your child to play a game in response to some sounds. You don't need to do anything. You're just welcome to sit back and watch. Um, and then for the child, we would say like, really enthusiastically, we're gonna play a game, I'll show you first and then it'll be your turn. So we hold the toy up to our ear and we wait for the whistle and then you would play the tone and then you put it in when you hear the whistle. We wanna be really exaggerated and fun so that the child knows it's gonna be a fun game. Um, if the child has a developmental delay or a speech and language delay, then you don't need to give as many instructions because they mo most likely won't understand it. So just demonstrating the game a few times will be easier for them to understand um, before we can start conditioning them. So the aim of conditioning the child is to teach them the task at a level that's audible for them to hear and ensure that the child knows to wait for sounds to be presented and strong conditioning will make it easier to get more results when you're testing. Um, and just at the bottom, we have a little overview of what we will need from the child, but I'll go into more detail in the next few slides. Um, so first, we will demonstrate the game to them, and this is when you would give instructions to the child with the headphones sitting on the table, like Isha said, and the diaphragms facing outwards towards the child. We start at 120 decibels to start off with um, coming out of the headphones. Um, Sometimes the child will require a few demonstrations before they'll do it by themselves. But once you think that the child understands the game or they begin to reach for the game, you can start to look for them to respond independently. Um, next slide, yep. We need two independent responses at 120 decibels before we can start turning the volume down. So when the child responds to the stimulus, give them a lot of social reinforcement so that they know that they're doing the game correctly. Um, it is also important to not have rhythmic presentations because otherwise it will be harder to determine if the child is actually responding to the sound or just responding at the same time in between your presentations. Um, after obtaining two independent responses at 120, you can then turn the dial down to 100 dB and we only need one response at this level. We turn it down so that the child knows that the sounds will eventually get quieter and that they can still respond even if it's quiet. Um, if you do get this response, it's time to move on to putting the headphones on the child. So before we do this, we want to turn down the dial to 50 dB first so that we don't accidentally present 100 decibels into the child's ear. Um, so once we do that, we can put the headphones on the child and start threshold seeking. Um, we do this by moving down in 20 decibel steps so that we can be more efficient in our presentations and we will get more responses. Uh, this is just because we every time we present, we predict that it's going to be the child's last response and we want to get the most out of the child to complete an audiogram. So from 50 dB, we would move down to 30 and then down to 10. 10 is the lowest level that we test down to for air conduction. And once we get to this level, we can just present twice to get two responses and call it a threshold. Um, once the child stops responding, we then move up in five dB steps and then back down in 10 dB steps, just like normal adult testing technique. So like I said, the lowest we test down to for air conduction is 10 dB, but for bone conduction, we go all the way down to negative 10 dB. Um, and again, once at these levels, you present twice to confirm the response. Um, so if you are able to determine which 
ear is the better hearing ear in history, we would preferably start with that one, but that's, we don't always know. Um, so just pick an ear to start with, but the testing order would be, for example, we started with the right ear, we would test the right ear at one kilohertz and then right ear at four kilohertz. And then we would switch to the left ear and stay at four kilohertz and then move on to one kilohertz. These are just because it covers the most of the um, frequencies that are needed for speech and language development. So once we get those, then we can move on to 500 hertz in both ears. We choose this one first because it is the most likely to determine if there's eustachian tube dysfunction. If the is a hearing loss in this frequency and then we would move on to two kilohertz for both ears which we predict would fall in between one and four if there's a hearing loss at any stage we would move on to bone conduction to determine the type of hearing loss uh, whether it's sensory neural or conductive and the first threshold we would normally test is four kilohertz as this is the frequency that's most likely to determine if it's sensory neural um, the start with the ear that has the biggest hearing loss for bone conduction. And now we just have a short video that will demonstrate play for you from start to finish. With children, it is vital to establish a good rapport from the outset. The audiologist can then begin training the child to perform the listening task. And then you watch all of the jelly beans. Now what does he do with the jelly beans? Okay. We wait for the whistle. <gasps> Here we go. Once the response is well established, headphones can be placed on the child. For younger children, this may involve a two-stage process, handheld at the ear initially, and then if possible, full placement onto the head. Mm -hmm. He got yellow hair and he's red. That's right. And he's got red glasses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, good. Now, we're going to put the headphones on. Whistles are in here. We'll put these on so you can hear more whistles. Okay. Don't you look good? Ready for a whistle. Oh, very good. Pop it in. Let's see if we can fill up the boat. There you go. Hey, you ready for another one? <gasps> Clever boy, in it goes. If a hearing loss is found under headphone testing, we aim to obtain bone conduction information to determine the nature of the observed hearing loss. Ready for the whistle. And in it goes, that's right. Well, Testing of children aged from around seven months to two and a half years of age requires a... Okay, so um, as you saw in the video, the child would take the headphones off every time he heard the sound. We can take this as he is responding, um, as long as it is consistent throughout all of the testing. 
Uh, so now we'll move on to Jack going through some different types of responders and some tips and tricks. Okay. So. Okay, so now I'm just going to jump in and mention a couple of exa uh, examples of kids that are maybe a bit more difficult to test and provide maybe some uh, examples of what we can do in these scenarios. So the first child is the false responder. So this is when the child completes the task when there hasn't actually been any presentation of the sound yet. Uh, this can be quite a big issue as if the child's allowed to keep doing this, they may lose their conditioning and the reliability of their responses can come into question. So what we do need to do is undo the action, meaning if they've put the dinosaur in the bucket without the whistle, you need to take the dinosaur back out and give it to them and just gently remind them to make sure they're waiting for the whistle. Um, so in scenarios where you have lost conditioning, what we would recommend is returning to a known audible level where they have reliably responded already and giving the instructions again, having a few practice goes and then going to proceed with threshold seeking again, once you're sure that they've got the game again. Uh, the next scenario is the hesitant responder. So this can happen when children are a little bit nervous or shy and they're just not sure about playing the game. Um, and so the first thing that we always try in this scenario is making sure we give them lots of encouragement, making sure that they feel supported in playing the game. However, if that doesn't work, uh, we can also try getting the parent or guardian to get in and have a go. This can be really good in getting the child to be more interested. And if we make sure that it looks like the parent's having heaps of fun, then the child you know, they become quite eager to get in and have a go themselves. They're almost jealous. Um, or we could try changing the game. As Isha mentioned previously, maybe the child has a particular toy they like. So we could ask the child themselves or the parent guardian. So for example, some kids may just really be into dinosaurs. And so switching to a game that involves dinosaurs could get them responding. Um, and so that's the hesitant responder. Now I just wanted to go over some general tips and tricks for approaching play. Um, so we'll get started with that. So first up, make sure it looks like it's fun. So we want loads of encouragement. And that's just because as we've already said, the funner it looks, the more likely the kid wants to get in and have a go themselves. Second, we wanna make sure that we're using age appropriate toys to keep the child engaged. And we also wanna make sure that we're ready to switch the game if they are getting bored. So again, we're interested in keeping them uh, involved in the game and it makes our lives easier if we do cater to their developmental level. So we want the younger children to have something nice and easy, like putting corks in a bucket, whereas we wanna give the older children something a little bit more complex. So maybe like building towers or connect four where they actually have to do a little bit more when they respond. Uh, number three, uh, clearly demonstrate the game to the child. Uh, this is just because when we give a clear demonstration, it sets up for really smooth testing. If we've got strong conditioning, we're often able to get a, a greater number of responses from the child, and therefore we're just more likely to get a complete audiogram. Um, and number four is just practice saying your turn now. A big thing when testing kids is just being firm with your delivery um, and not really giving them options to say no. So just practicing saying your turn now in like a really strong way sets you up for success. Uh, okay, number five, don't ask them questions. I sort of just mentioned this. So asking kids questions gives them an opportunity to say no. So if you were to say something like, do you want to put the headphones on? That's giving the child to say no, they can flat out deny it and then you're a bit stuck. Whereas if you go straight in and you say, now we're gonna put those headphones on, usually it goes much smoother. They're not getting the option to sort of slip away from you. Um, and so that's what we're really looking for. Um, and then five, make sure you're using appropriate language. So for the younger kids, don't use too much language. They can become quite confused and they prefer more visual demonstrations. Whereas for those older kids, uh, you want to give them actually a bit more detailed language. They can become a bit uh, insulted uh, and they appreciate it when you treat them like they're an adult. So giving them more of a verbal explanation rather than a visual usually works quite well. And finally, just make sure that you're never showing how bothered you are when going, uh, when things aren't quite going as 
you would like. So, you know, if the kid starts to become distressed, don't show that it's bothering you, just confidently keep going with testing and usually that works. Um, so that is all of my tips and tricks. Now I'll pass back to Georgia and she's gonna walk us through some case studies. Hey, thanks, Jack. Um, we've got two different case studies today, but the first one that we'll start with is um, Lily and she's two and a half years old. So there has been some concerns with her speech and language development. She only has about 20 clear words, um, but she has started putting two words together, which is good. Um, she uses gesture to communicate what she wants um, and she can understand simple instructions. There's no concerns with her hearing. Um, she, is resp she responds when she's called from another room and she responds to environmental noises um, and she doesn't have a history of ear infections. Um, so from this history, we can see that her speech and language is definitely a bit of a concern because by two and a half, we would expect her to have about 200 words. Um, so we would do a hearing test to see if that is impacting on her speech and language development at all. Um, so with the results, uh, before we go through it, I'll just explain what KTT is quickly. Um, so the Kendall Toy Test or KTT is a speech test used to demonstrate what, is, um, what speech a child is actually able to hear. Um, it's a series of words that the audiologist will say with their voice measured on a sound level meter and the results that are 9 out of 10 at 40 dBA or better is a pass and it demonstrates the child's hearing is adequate for speech and language. So now putting all the results together, um, they managed to get a full audiogram all with normal hearing bilaterally across the frequencies tested. And she has type A tympanograms bilaterally, which means we have normal middle ear compliance. And like we said with the KTT, it's 10 out of 10 at 35 dBA. So that is adequate for speech and language development. So what we would do with this child is refer them on to a speech pathologist for some help with their speech and language development because we've determined that hearing isn't the problem in this situation. Um, so next we have Estelle and she's four years and two months old. Um, she has experienced recent ear infection in her right ear with pain and discharge, which required antibiotics. Um, her mum thinks that her hearing is otherwise okay, but the kinder teacher has some concerns about Estelle's communication. So she's not particularly clear to, peop to unfamiliar people and she leaves off some words. Um, leaves off the end of some words, sorry. Um, so like the P in map or the S sounds in glass. And she has difficulty pronouncing K words. So instead of cat, she'll say tat. Um, her receptive and expressive language, however, is okay. Um, so we now did some testing. And the order of testing that most likely would have happened is starting with the left ear because in the history, it was said that her right ear just had a recent infection and it was painful and discharging. So we might have started with the left ear. Um, and we would have done the left ear AC and then the right ear AC first. Um, and because she was in a good response state, we could get all of the frequencies we needed. Um, then we would have put the bone conductor on the left ear because it does show a hearing loss. Um, first, it would have tested four kilohertz and then um, the one kilohertz, which they are both coming in at normal range. So we can determine that her underlying hearing is normal. Um, 
Yep. So from the testing, we can say that her right ear is essentially normal hearing because um, one, two and four kilohertz are all within normal and the 500 is just a mild hearing loss. Um, the left ear, we would say, is a mild conductive hearing loss because with our bones, they are in the normal range. Um, and our tympanograms, we have a B high in the right ear, which could be a perforation. We're not sure because we, have, we don't have her otoscopy, but it could explain some of the pain and the discharge. Um, the type B low in the left ear could be some middle ear effusion, which explains the conductive hearing loss that we have going on. Um, so for her management, we could probably refer her to an ear, nose and throat specialist and then review her again in three months um, and send her off to a speech pathologist as well in the meantime, because she is four and a half four years old so hearing should be adequate for speech and language development at this stage um, and she still has some speech issues going on um yep so then she comes back three months later for her review appointment and these are the results we got so everything is now within the normal range and the type c that we have in the left ear tympanogram could just be the B low that we got from last time still recovering and then transitioning into a type A. Um, so now that we have determined her uh, hearing is within the normal range, it will prove that her hearing is adequate for speech and language. So it's not contributing to the concerns that she has. Um, but it may help with the sounds she was having trouble with, like the P, S, and K, because they are all in the high frequencies, which were down the last time we tested it. Um, we could review her again before she starts school, just to double check that her hearing stays normal. And the parents can always bring her back if she has any further concerns. Um, so that's all we've got for case studies and Isha will run you through a quick quiz. Okay, so we just have a short quiz before we end our presentation for today. So you can pop the answers in the chat box and we can talk through the answers then. Okay, so the first question for today is what is the age range for performing play audiometry? Jack and Georgia can also participate. Okay, we have some answers coming through. And yes, that's the correct answer. The age range is from two to two and a half years to seven years. Um, the age range ends at seven years because after seven years, we can do the adult pure tone audiometry. And it's as we discussed earlier, it starts from two to two and a half age range. So that's the right answer. Good job, guys. Okay, so the second question is what stimuli, which stimuli used for play audiometry? So you can pop the answers in the chat box. Okay, we have an answer coming through, which is A, that's the right answer. Okay. So we do use wobble tones in play audiometry. So that's good job, guys. Okay, so the third question for today is during conditioning, how many independent responses do we need before we go down to 100 dB? Now this is, this was discussed in the testing procedure in the conditioning phase. Any guesses? See, that's right. That's the right answer. We do require two independent responses before we go down and re reduce the volume. 
Okay, and one final question is during testing, what are some strategies you can apply to keep the child engaged? Yeah, that's... <laughs> Yeah, that's the correct answer. That's D, we, we need to apply as many strategies as we can. So that includes reinforcement with clapping and age appropriate toys and we need can change the toy if we need it. So that was all from us. Good job and thank you for listening. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Right, thank you so much to our speakers. That was a really wonderful talk and hopefully we all learned a little bit about, um, about play audiometry and um, how to do an audiogram on a child. Does anybody have any questions? We can open it up to group discussion um, or feel free to, to uh, type into the chat. Um, we have some, some moments here. Um, and I did wanna make a quick introduction um, before we wrap up. So if you do have any questions, feel free to, feel free to type them in and we'll, we'll get them answered before the end. Um, but I wanted to make an introduction um, for uh, Dr. Misha Verkirk, who has joined us. For all of our Tanzania participants, um, I'll be coming back in a couple weeks, and um, joining me will be um, Dr. Verkirk from the UK. Um, he works with uh, an organization called Globally NT Outreach, and um, he'll be um, helping with developing the uh, the otology. Um, sort of supporting the otology training program that Dr. Buname and team um, led by Dr. Alex I, uh, will, be, will be sort of embarking on. So, um, Chawi, if we could let uh, Misha, or I, I don't know if you're able to. Yes, <laughs> good. <laughs> well, good morning from England. Um, it's about 5.45 here. Um, it's really lovely um, to be able to say hello, and thank you for letting me tag on to the end of your very interesting lectures and quiz. That sounded great. Um, uh, just wanted to say hello to all of you in Mwanza. Um, I had a fantastic chat with uh, Dr. Alex yesterday about your hospital, and I'm really looking forward to coming um, and visiting. Um, a little bit about me so that you know who I am, but I'm basically right at the end of my uh, residency in the UK. I'm an otologist. I'm uh, um, I have some experience um, in basically running a, a program in Ethiopia where we helped a, a hospital develop their otology service and founded a temporal bone lab. And um, I work with this small charity that helps to bring otologists out to uh, places where they, there aren't any. And we help train and our focus is on, on purely on education. So um, I'm hoping to be able to come come over and to provide as much education in ear surgery and, and ear disease as I can. Um, and then the aim is ultimately to, to bring um, maybe a, every year or twice a year, some otologists and audiologists out to you uh, to help with some hands-on training uh, in Bugando. So it's, it's just a pleasure to be invited and thank you to Leah for the introduction. Yes, of course. And um, for anybody else from other countries as well, both me and uh, Dr. Berker are involved with um, organizations that work around the, the world. So always feel free. I'm going to leave my email in the chat here and um, you can reach out if there's any uh, questions. And of course, our, our lovely colleagues at the University of Melbourne have uh, donated a lot of their time and effort to, um, to helping provide some audiology lectures and education. So um, we are all available um, if needed. You can also reach out through Mending Kids and our team there will get you plugged in. So I think with that, I will say thank you to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody on, on the call. And, um, and yeah, thank you for joining. Um, this is kind of the last lecture of our six part audiology series. Um, but there will be more coming down the pipeline for sure. Um, so stay tuned and we'll, um, you know, we'll be sending out a survey uh, at the end of uh, this series as well to get some feedback and please do respond. We'd love to know what countries you're from and, and what kind of um, 
you know, what, what we can do to help support um, ENT education in, in, uh, globally. So um, any feedback is welcome and we will, uh, we will be he hearing from you soon. Okay. Take care, everybody.